Embassy of the Dead, Chapter 26, The Undoing of Rose Bihari. Jake stopped, with one foot on the ground and the other lodged into the thick vine that grew up the ramshackle cottage. He looked over his shoulder. The fox had followed him across the front garden, and now it had paused some twenty metres away, its head cocked to one side in a way that seemed to be saying, I know you are up to no good. Up to no good, thought Jake. What do you know? My life depends on undoing Rose Bihari. Does that give you a right to break into someone's house? Jake shook his head and turned back to the house. He had to stop having imaginary conversations with the fox and focus on the task at hand. Just before arriving at Rose's house, Jake had had to have a power nap, as Mum called them. He hadn't slept properly since Sunday night. It was now Wednesday and he couldn't keep his eyes open any longer. His head nodded like it always did in double maths, and Jake reluctantly pulled over. Stiffkey had tucked the waxed jacket round Jake and told him he'd stand guard for a couple of hours and then wake him. It had felt like only minutes later when Stiffkey gently shook Jake, who groaned and faced the other way. Cora used an altogether different tactic, whipping the jacket off him and shouting right in his ear, Wakey, wakey, lazy bones! Jake grudgingly opened one eye and then the other as the memories of the last few days came flooding back. They drove the last few miles in silence. A serious air had grown between them. This was it. His and Stiffkey's last chance to save themselves. It had to work this time. It just had to. Jake parked outside Rose's house. He slung his rucksack on and stepped outside into the bright afternoon light. Good luck, boy, said Stiffkey, patting him on the shoulder. Yeah, break a leg, said Cora, or an arm. She smiled in a way that could maybe be described as friendly. Jake waved at his friends before walking purposefully up the garden path. He remembered the notes from Rose's file. Rose Bahari, born 1961, died 1991, type Spectre. Just a nice spectre like Stiffkey, a friendly ghost. What could go wrong? Jake had looked all around the house for a way in, pushing through gaps in the thick hedgerow, wading through knee-high nettles, but the boarded up building, all overgrown with weeds and covered in thick ivy, looked impenetrable from the ground. Then, looking up, he had noticed a small broken window on the first floor as it winked in the late afternoon sun. Why couldn't he just find an open door for once? Apart from a slight wind rustling through the trees, everything was silent. He paused as he heard a sound. Did it come from inside the house? It could have been anything. A footstep, perhaps, or maybe just the creaking of the old house as it shifted slightly in the wind. Jake reached out and tugged the ivy. It seemed fairly secure at the bottom, at least. He reached up to one of the larger branches and began to climb. He made slow progress and the leaves scratched against his face. Eventually, though, his hands felt the wooden ledge. Pulling himself level with the window, he poked a hand carefully through the broken pane and unlocked the catch. Then he jammed his fingers around the edge of the window and gave the frame a sharp tug. It swung open and for a split second he was lost, fumbling for a handhold. Then his fingers caught the wooden rim again the sensation of a splinter burying into his palm, accompanied by a huge sense of relief. He gritted his teeth as little by little he dragged himself through the open window before collapsing in a pile onto the carpet, sending up a cloud of dust. He was in a bedroom. At first it seemed that nothing had been changed or moved since Rose Bahari's death. An empty cup stood on a bedside table, a dressing gown hung from the door, Everything was covered in a thick coating of dust, but something had changed. All the drawers in her bedside cabinet were open. A wardrobe door had been left ajar. Someone had been here since her death, someone searching for something. A cobwebbed photo frame stood on the dressing table. He picked it up. A lady around his mum's age. He wondered if this was Rose Bahari. She looked younger than he'd expected. He sighed as he felt a weird rush of sadness pass over him. Almost like he was about to cry, he swallowed. Pull yourself together. Jake pushed the drawers shut. 
It felt weird them being open, revealing their contents to the world. Rose deserved more respect. He wondered why the house hadn't been cleaned. She might not have had any family. He felt a wave of unexpected sadness. If Morkins did drag him to the eternal void, then at least he could count on Mum, and probably even Dad, to sort his things out and not leave his underwear drawer open for complete strangers to see. He reminded himself that at least he was here to help Rose. She would want to move on to the afterworld. She'd have the longings. In a way, it was like being an undertaker, like Stifke. But instead of helping the relatives come to terms with the death of a loved one, you're helping the loved one come to terms with their own death. As he went to close the top drawer, he noticed an old-fashioned personal CD player. He picked it up, blew off the dust and turned it round in his hands. He thought of his dad and his record player, how he always wanted Jake to listen to the songs he loved. Curiosity got the better of him. Jake pressed the open button and the lid popped up, presenting him with the edge of a shiny disc. Beginner's Spanish. Maybe Rose was going to move to Spain but didn't get the chance. Or maybe she was just about to go on holiday. But then again, maybe she was just learning Spanish for the fun of it. Although thinking back to the one term he had learned Spanish in school, he couldn't imagine anybody finding it that fun. El Gato Negro, Jake muttered to himself. Names and colours of animals was basically all the Spanish he had. Useful if he ever needed to buy a black cat from a Spanish pet shop. Carefully, he closed the lid and placed the CD player back in the drawer, gently pushing it shut. The trip to Spain, the loneliness, all things that might be to do with Rose Bahari's haunting, the seemingly infinite reasons why her soul might have been trapped on the earthly plane seemed overwhelmingly hopeless. Jake left the bedroom and found himself on the landing. Stairs led down to darkness, the boarded up windows on the ground floor barely letting in any light. He took a tentative step down and his foot went through a rotten floorboard, causing him to stumble forward. He fumbled desperately for the banister, momentarily relieved to find it intact, but then with a splitting sound, the banister cracked and he was falling, falling into the blackness. That's when he saw something, or nothing. It was hard to explain, as though he was watching himself from the bottom of the stairs, except it wasn't him, it was Rose. She was standing at the top of the stairs. Steps that weren't rotten and collapsing. The house wasn't derelict either. It was how it must have been all those years ago, neat and tidy, the wallpaper no longer faded and peeling. And then he saw the figure appear behind her. Jake tried to shout a warning from the bottom of the stairs, but the cry caught in his throat. Then the shadowed figure gave a shove. And Rose stumbled and fell from the top of the way all the way to the bottom of the stairs before landing on the hard kitchen floor. Her body remained still. Jake squeezed his eyes shut, then opened them again. The vision had faded. The house was derelict once more, and he was lying on his back with his legs over his head at the bottom of the stairs. But the memories of what he'd just seen were as clear as if he'd been there that fatal day. He'd seen Rose Bahari fall, and someone had pushed her. Well, that's quite a serious story, isn't it? So he's going to have to... Do you think that's the uh, what yeah, he's going to have the, to do? Yeah, I think he's going to have to, like, find out who or explain to Rose Bahari uh, what happened with her death. That's quite complicated, that, that, isn't it? That's a big job. Or just take her to Spain. No, it's got to be to do with her death and the way she died. Well, she... <laughs> just take her to Spain. Taking her to Spain would also be pretty tricky when you're a thirteen-year-old kid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and and he's got Morkins and this other guy on his tail. Mm -hmm. Hey, I wonder if it's the guy, if it's related to the the guy who's searching for the finger. Yeah. Uh, who's know, now think... been through all of her drawers as well? Someone's also, been through the drawers. Also, yeah, yeah. I think it's the the murderer uh, murdered them. So to get her out of the way so that they could search through the drawers. Yes, yes. But it must have been, it was quite a long time ago, wasn't it? Because she died in 2000 So they might have been planning it. Died in 1991, actually. And she was only, she was born 1961, died 1991. How old was she? 30. 
Only 30 years old, the same age as his mum. She might have um, planned it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, they might have planned it so they were planning the whole thing, the people who stole the finger. Hey, if they Jake's were... 13 and she, Rose Bihari is about the same age as his mum, when did his mum have Jake? Um, How old was 17. she? About 17. Gosh. It's very I'm, young. I'm not, I think he might be imagining it. Okay.